adjusting a hearing aid. Hello. There it is. No, I, don't, I have no idea how to use that. Oh. Hi. Can you hear me now? Well, hey. Can uh, you hear that, girl? Hi, Harold. I heard you for a second. You did? Can you hear me now? I stopped speaking. Maybe I that's... Can hear you now. Oh, well, good. <laughs> now I'm just so continuing to... I can hear you now. It's not loud and clear, but uh, I can hear you. Hi, Harold. Hello, Alan. <laughs> good to see you. Why aren't you here, Alan? No, oh, because I'm here. I mean, why are you there, Harold? Yes. <laughs> really, I mean, but you're safe and sound, aren't you, down there? You're not... Uh, well, I am. I, yeah. I'm good. I'm glad because we hear... We hear well, you remember my place here. Yeah. And it's really very comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. It serves me very well. You've got AC there? Do you? The studio and living space are all on one level. No stairs, no, no climb. So... Oh, good. I remember. And you have air conditioning? Yeah. yeah with, without air conditioning, there's no Florida. <laughs> tell you, we have been doing a number of these interviews with artists whose work has been sort of uh, shut down because of the pandemic. Not really the case with yours. We're having a show of yours coming up later this year. I'm very excited by it. We are. I think it's, it's great. I, I love it that it's at the Waterfall Arts, and I love it that it's Belfast, and I, I, I am delighted with the people involved. You know, Harold, I first met you after you had retired from your career in teaching and moved to Belfast quite a few years ago now. Yep. I don't, I don't remember what year that was. Uh, in the 80s. In the 80s, yeah, that's right, exactly. Yep. And you lived across the river here at the time, right along the shore. When you were teaching, were you painting as much as you do have done since you've retired? Well, I'm actually, it's an old story. A busy guy gets a lot done. And the busy you are, the more you do. So I probably was doing a lot more painting when I was still teaching and splitting my time at first between Brooklyn and here now Florida and, and in, uh, in Maine. Uh, so uh, fortunately, I had, was able to have studios in both places. Yeah, I do think the 80s was a very different look, but a very productive time because I could meet all you guys, meet the people locally, enjoy bouncing off the local energy and have the time to paint. Yeah. without a job at the same time without so I picked up some uh, some some teaching having the uh, workshops but it was very different than when I was teaching full time you mentioned printmaking uh, just the hearing aid okay okay uh, did you hear what I said yeah like, your productive and I've had the shows that I've had shows over People love your work and they love you and your positive attitude. But one other thing that I remember is you invented this technique that you call strapo. Plus, I want to also say that you've been a writer and you won a, an award at the one 15-minute play thing in Belfast. Ah, but that also has a story, Alan. <laughs> I had more fun. I still had more fun with the play than anything else. Being taken seriously and asking the words and asking explain what did it mean when he said did you know how I loved you instead of saying you know how I love you to, you know, what does that mean I get a call like that at 11 o'clock at night and I love it somebody cares that much you know, it's good good beautiful stuff but I'd like to take a look at some of the work that you're going to be showing at Waterfall in the fall how would that be could we talk about yeah, that? I'll take a look at it but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be uh, as trying very hard to be meaningful, and I'll answer questions, but actually, uh, it, the, the work has to stand for itself. It's the clearest, strongest statements I'm able to make, I believe, when it works well, and, uh, and it's there for people to see. And I hope 
a little bit puzzled, a little bit intrigued, uh, and a lot, a lot of interest uh, may come from because I'm uh, um, just proud of the series. I think it's an exciting group of artwork. What I like about them, there is some spontaneity, there's, there's a freshness, and there's, a, I think, a lot of demand for uh, just visually enjoying it. And I flatter myself enough by saying, and I think also people who know art will realize that the freshness and the openness of that is a sign of skill and not a sign of uh, just laziness because I'm a lazy old guy. But then. <laughs> Now, I remember going through a show with you of another person's work. Uh, we walked around together, and you said something at the time to me that was very meaningful to me. You said um, that what you liked about this person's work was the pieces that looked like they had never been done before, and that you were kind of working towards that in your own work all the time, that when you saw what you were doing and realized that you had never seen yourself do something like that before. You felt very good about it. And am I, did I get that correct, Harold? I mean, I believe- Well, you probably have, and it proves what a jackass I am, because <laughs> anytime you think something's good because they try to do what was never done before, you're just fooling yourself. You're just fooling yourself. It's, it's a, a deep pit that you fall into. To do something totally unique in one level, you can't avoid because you are unique, the individual great thing about art is it is the product of an individual being as true to themselves as possible. But the, uh, uh, the goal for so long seemed to have been, as I got to know other artists who had some level of success on whatever thing you define, would make a big deal of not showing their work to other people to hear their work like them. And I never understood that. I just recognized it when it was there and it, it surprised the hell out of me that somebody would care, would feel that, that they're inventing or, or developing or make. So uh, when they asked me about Strapa, which you mentioned, it's a technique I developed. It's painting on uh, on glass and transferring the image, the acrylic image, uh, to a support, generally paper, uh, on that, and you get a unique image. And uh, I won't let anybody say I invented it. You don't you know it. You don't invent a technique. You develop or use it, but you, you don't. It's not invention. It's developmental. It's mental. It's mental and physical, it's seeing what paint can do, what you can do, where your mind takes you, what you learn from what you paint. Those are the things that matter. And when, when you see that in somebody's work, uh, it can be very exciting. It's one, one way one, uh, of being in an art community is to sense when that's happening uh, with people you know. And yeah. that's very, very gratifying because you uh, I how do I put it well? It's like looking into a mirror if they allow it. So it's not only you you see, you also see background. And the same thing is true. If you look into a painting, you want to see the artist and you want to know the artist as a producer of a particular work. And but by doing that, you're also figuring out who you are. And so I don't think these paintings are complete without many completions from somebody interested enough to look at them and pick up hints and clues and associations. So the surrealist part gets in there and the cubist part gets in there and the monotypist gets in there. And I think, uh, the simplification look, which I enjoy, is, is allowing all, all those other factors to play their own part in a painting. I think what I got out of what you said at that show when we were walking around together was that uh, 
you felt that an artist should really push himself or herself to go into territory or to accept territory that they hadn't seen of themselves in the past. And that that was a, a valuable place to find yourself as an artist. Yeah, the difference there, Alan, is, you know, the difference between craft, which we develop, and artwork is craft is where you pretty know what everything is going to be or so close to it that you're not really still discovering or communicating about who you are as much as what you see is more important than who you are. So, uh, yeah, there's this good, there's, if you give yourself a chance, there's good excitement, really good excitement in looking at a good artwork that has some feeling of discovery that you can identify with. These are looser than many other things that I've seen you make. Yes. Yeah. They're really quite loose, a lot of dripping, uh, a lot of letting things happen, and uh, coming up with imagery that's pretty powerful, I think, emotionally. Um, do you have any feeling about that that you wanted to say about, about the emotion of, of what these images are saying? So I also think one of the things that communicate is the emotionality of loosely painted brush strokes. As, as I, I think that has an emotional content and I think people can feel it. Good point, yeah. That the stroke is not being put on with a straight edge or anything. Right. That, right. That there is an energy. Like a painting like this that we're looking at now, um, when I first look at it, it has this impact on me that there are many different beingnesses expressed here. There's many different um, personalities or presences. There's not just one presence. There's like four, four or five presences here, all in one painting. I hope so. Yeah, I think there's reason for uh, for the size, the freedom with which your brush strokes are made, the understanding of the color uh, as being worthy of examination and emotional response, and then uh, and the we were not. That's why I said the is probably a hangover from cubistic work. The idea of seeing something as if it were a limited rectangle photograph mm. is something I'm breaking away from. Yeah. So if you can look at it and find a series of images that somehow add up in an emotional bundle, that's great when that happens. The size and the scale is pretty impressive for, I don't want to, you know, for a person of your, of your um, august, age. These are yes. energetic paintings. Yeah. Very energetic yeah. Yeah. Paintings. Uh, it's, It'll be energetic paintings for some old man laughing at something, but I don't know what this old man is laughing at, but wanting to work that, that big. And yeah. it's also a great thing to wind up with uh, here, finding some of the people responding and needing help because of the physical size of it. Bridget okay. helped me. She's your neighbor and friend and delightful. And she helped me with the physicality of making them, priming them, pinning them up, and being with me, making me laugh at myself. Bridget Matros. Um, She's one. The painting, Harold, are these paintings at all scary to you? Do they, do they, are they representative? Are they somewhat scary? No, no, no. 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 no the, the emotional, I has to have an emotional quality. When I was first doing abstract expressions, and being not completely non-figurative, it was losing an emotional quality to come. But if you look at some of these things and you see a head or a face or, or eyes and things like that, and if you're alive and look to it, you're going to get an emotional response. And it may not be the same one you would get tomorrow. Right, right, that's true, yeah. I'm delighted to see them on the screen. They really look good. Don't they look good? They really do look great. Yeah. 
Well, Harold, it's been great talking to you, and I'd love to do this again sometime. Well, I'm, I'm delighted that you're doing this. I'm delighted that it's where it's being done. I, I could not be more pleased. I just could not. Take care, Alan. One, two, three, four. I'm going to stop the recording now. By the way, thank you for being you.